Spotlight, Spotlight with Jerome. Sit down. The show's starting. Hi all. I had the pleasure to chat with uh, the fabulous Tom Ball today in Spotlight. Uh, Tom Ball is the author of uh, the Bilingual Readers, published by the Language Gym. Uh, the main story is called Extranjeros uh, in four parts in Spanish, Les Etrangers in French. And it's a story of a teenage boy who wakes up lying in the hot cobbles of Toledo in a Spanish story or Toulouse in the street. And he has no memory of who he is or why he's in Spain or in France. So he sets on a quest to discover his own identity and purpose. So that's a really, really exciting story. And uh, there is also a parallel series uh, called Relatos in Spanish or Reci in French talking about the different adventures of the main characters before meeting up in Toledo or before meeting up in Toulouse. So these books are aimed at the GCSE students, level A2 and B1, and written with high frequency vocab from 2,500 most frequent Spanish or French words. So grab a drink, sit comfortably and enjoy the interview. Yeah, it has been something that's progressed over the last well, I've got to tell you like four decades now, because I'm, I'm getting a bit old now, but uh, it's always been something I was very interested in. And, and when I was at school, I, I studied English and, and did A-levels in English as well. And I actually planned to go on to university to do English because I was always interested in particularly reading and then creating my own stories. Um, and it, it's actually really a lot of the inspiration stemmed from, from the traveling that I've done because I, I knew from a young age that I wanted to to travel the world. And well, I, I, I was very lucky. And when I was 18, I, I managed to escape England. I still love England, but, you know, I escaped the, the cold, harsh English weathers. And I somehow, which I won't bore you with now, ended up on a, a dive boat in, in Papua New Guinea. And I essentially lived an adventure novel with all sorts of weird and wonderful characters. And I experienced some incredible adventures my, myself during that year where I was working on this dive boat in, in Papua New Guinea. And I think that while I was there, it was quite meta because I was almost conscious that I was living this adventure story and the, the, sort of the seed was sown, um, which later turned into my first novel. And I, I, I wrote uh, a novel called Pless Tambu, which is about um, a character who's actually a diplomat and a linguist who um, is sent to Papua New Guinea and gets embroiled in this quite complex mystery um, uh, and travels all over the region um, using his linguistic skills to, to solve the mystery. Um, and since Papua New Guinea, I've, I've lived in a whole bunch of other countries, um, lived in the US, I've, I've spent time in France, I've spent time in Spain, I've spent a year in Japan as well. Um, and all the while meeting all of these wonderful characters, it's, it's pro uh, provided me with so much inspiration for, for stories and I've just started writing them down really. I'm, I'm currently um, searching for a publisher. So that's one that um, I have a lovely editor who I've been working with for, for a little while now. And I think it's, it's now in really good shape, the novel. Writing a novel is very different to writing these shorter format stories that the novel is about 100,000 words long. And I think initially it was maybe double that. And uh, because it was my first novel, um, it's been a real labor of love. But I'm very happy with it now. So yeah, um, watch this space. I'm hoping that it will be published. And what's also lovely, actually, is my second novel is is waiting. I've got it in my head, ready to put down on paper. And that one, you can possibly guess, is going to be based in Malaysia, which I which is where I current currently live. And it's linked to another sort of conspiracy and mystery. These are all linguistic mysteries. Um, this one is is linked to a conspiracy within the the Catholic Church. Um, that affects uh, people in, in Malaysia. And this diplomat kind of picks up the mystery when, when a young girl goes missing um, and he has to so solve a series of linguistic clues to, to try and find out what's, what's actually happened to the, this girl, who's his niece as well. Yeah, for sure. I think you've got to, in my opinion, you've got to, to write what you know about. So I write uh, often about languages. I write about uh, exotic locations where I've actually lived and been, and I know the people. A lot of the characters are people that I know. And you've got to write what you like. So I, I tend to write stories that I would want to read. 
and and I enjoy reading back the extranjero stories uh, kind of with a little sly smile because I know what's going on I know what's going to happen um, and the same with with my novels it's, these are things that I think I would like to pick up and, and read and it's always very pleasing particularly with the novel because quite a number of people have read the novel even though it's not yet published um, and people often say the same sorts of things that, that I feel like you know wow this is uh, like I've been transported to a, a really exotic world on the other side of, of the world you know particularly they're reading it in the UK and, and I really want to know what happened to, to this person or what what the story is with this mystery so that's exactly what I'm aiming for. Yeah, essentially, it's because uh, a bit like my colleagues, Gianfranco Conti and, and Dylan Vinales, um, we were just not happy with the resources that were out there. You know, the amount of time students said, I'd love to read something um, over the long summer holiday or over the Christmas break, or I wish we could do something in class that would really transport me to some of these places that you're telling us about. And there really wasn't anything out there. There were There were lots of readers that were either a bit banal and they didn't really engage the kids. They were just a bit simplistic or there were um, very basic stories that were aimed at a much younger age level, but that the language level would have been appropriate for, for our kids who are sort of 14, 15, 16. So I thought, actually, why don't we look at the GCSE topics? And there's just, you know, a wealth of language there within the, the GCSE topics and the first 2000 words, um that uh the new igcc spec is is looking at and there's just you know so much scope to write these stories and and as i say i thought well if we can then start that story in uh toledo which is where i've started the extranjero stories or with some of the other stories that you know you've worked on in places like toulouse and paris um you know it really takes the kids there and and you can really show them firsthand what these places are like uh, and it's great fun The Extranjeros and the Relatos books are all written in Spanish. So uh, the reason I do that, I, I write novels in English, but the reason I write the books in Spanish is, well, a couple of reasons. Firstly, because in order to gauge the language level correctly, um, I need to do it in uh, through sort of the eyes of a language learner. And, and therefore I have to use the structures and the vocabulary that we're working with from the IGCC spec. So I start with a topic and, and I build it up. For example, Extranjeros 1, starts very much with the daily routine uh, topic and, and you use that vocabulary and that takes you into the world. Um, as a native speaker of English, I think it's, it's much harder um, to do that and think about what the translation would be. So I'd rather start with the language that I'm actually trying to teach. Um, I also, I, I'm married to um, a lovely lady, Carlota, who's from Spain and her family uh, lives near to Toledo. They're, they're from Madrid and Barcelona, but they they live uh, near to Toledo. So I have first-hand experience there. And I also have her kind of looking over my shoulder and, and making sure that the language sounds natural and authentic because I'm not a native speaker. I'm a Spanish teacher, but I'm not um, a native speaker. So that really helps when I am writing in Spanish to have a native speaker just occasionally giving me a nudge in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, I think in, in a way, it's been a wonderful process for me. I, I've, I've learned so much out of it because writing a novel in your native tongue um, that is for a general audience or an adult audience, you can really go to town on the descriptions and technical vocabulary and scientific vocabulary and whatever you want can get thrown in there. I've got a lot of nautical terminology and geographical terminology in my, my novel, um, but you really have to think hard. And it's almost, it's, it's an art form in itself to be able to write books using appropriate language but still make it engaging and captivating um, because the moment you start to kind of dumb it down and, and use really simple language uh, the kids feel patronized they, they don't feel that they're enjoying a real story they, they think it's a kid's book so the aim really is to make it feel like a proper story a proper novel an adventure um, but make sure that they understand you know 90 95 percent of the language and they have a bilingual uh, column in, in all of the books so that if they do ever get a little bit lost or there's some vocabulary they're not sure about there's some idiomatic phrases that, that we like to use because we do teach them a lot at, uh, at our school then they can quickly uh, look over at the other column and immediately understand what, what we're talking about
the books, actually writing the books, we use them in class because as we went through the process of writing and editing the stories and, and creating them, we had a team of 30 plus students who, who were reading them and giving us feedback. So just before we'd even actually finished the books, that was brilliant. And that's something that I recommend people try, even if you just write um, a short paragraph, some kind of a short story to share that with your kids and get them engaged and even give them options, they can change the story. Um, so that's the first thing. Now the books are, are published and they're out there. Um, we use them really as a springboard to explore firstly the topics. So with the first Extranjeros book, we look at the kind of daily routine story, the all about me um, themes within the GCSE spec. Um, so they're studying that through doing listening activities and speaking activities separately. Um, but then we'll read a chapter together in class. And then we set it as, as homework tasks. And actually it's homework, the first homework that I think I've ever set the kids enjoy doing. So they go away and they come back and say, you know what, I actually read two chapters. I read the, the, the whole book. And then you can set them off on, on the next one. Um, and then when, when we do that, and, you know, I don't want to teach, uh, I don't want to tell the, the teachers how to suck eggs, but, you know, we, we do a lot of exploring what's going to happen next. And, you know, what about this character? Tell me a description of this character. And, uh, you know, what do you like about the story? And, and we also look at the, the grammar behind it as well. There is even a workbook that Dylan and Jan Franco created for the first Extranjeros book that uses the language to look at the grammar. So, yeah, basically it's a, this, a springboard to go into a topic. Um, but I would say if there's one thing, it's just that you can actually have homework that the kids enjoy doing. Not to say that they don't enjoy their homework. Of course they do. But um, reading and reading a story that you want to read is a really quite a, a novel experience for them, pun mm -hmm. intended. I came to Garden, Garden International School in, in Kuala Lumpur uh, five years, five and a half years ago. This is now my sixth year. So 2017, I arrived and actually Jan was, was still teaching at the school. Yeah, he subsequently left after 14 years at the school. And Dylan was just starting as the, the head of Spanish. So it was very kind of serendipitous that Jan Franco, who I'm sure many of the people watching this video will be familiar with, is... Um, you know, just an, an incredible inspiration for so many people. He uh, really understands teaching. He understands the way that languages are learned. And so he was just working like this dynamo in, in the department, looking at different pedagogies, um, research, and actually, you know, trying things out on the kids. Um, meanwhile, Dylan was uh, just starting out as a head of department. And I think he was working very, very closely with, with Jan Franco. And Dylan is such a hardworking guy who is so smart and so kind of analytical that I think he took a lot of the best things that Jan Franco um, has found in the research and has found in his own experience and, and sort of taken them almost to the next level. So the two of them together are just a, a force of nature. Um, so I was very lucky as the head of faculty, so new head of fa faculty worked it, work, walked in, almost like taking over some kind of a football team with uh, amazing superstars in there and I just had to make sure that they had what they needed to, to do the job. We connected quite quickly. We, the three of us uh, and others um, with whom we work in, in the faculty connected very quickly and so yeah, we became close friends and, and we were socialising and talking and doing sport together and whatnot and, and you learn more and more about each other and um, I guess initially I, I don't always share all of the things that I do outside of school, but I did at some point mention, oh, you know, I've, I've written this novel, I'm finishing it off. Maybe you guys might be interested in reading it. And I saw Gianfranco's eyes light up immediately. He's sort of calculating, okay, how could we use this? This guy's got a skill I didn't know about. What can we do? And so he was very interested in, in what, I'd, what I'd written and the kinds of stories. And uh, he liked the sound of them. So he, he made the suggestion and then Dylan was on board. Um, I mean, I don't want to give Jan Franco all of the credit. I think Dylan was also a driving force to say, you know what, we can make these things work. Look at the sentence builders books that we do, the language that goes into those and the IGC revision books, put that into an interesting setting with an interesting storyline. And they basically gave me that remit and sent me off for a few months to just, just write something and, you know what lockdown happened or lockdown two or whatever it was. And there I was at home with a bit of extra spare time. 
and just started doing my thing. Um, Dylan and I were joking that we had this whole period we called uh, Tom and Dylan 5.0 because we would be getting up at five in the morning. He was working on his projects and I was writing. So from five until 6.30 every morning, I would turn the laptop on and just start writing. Um, and, you know, th these are some of the things that I came up with. So it's one of those things I've got, I've got so many, I, I, I'm a bit like a, a magnet for these ideas. Uh, the ideas come from all sorts of different places and with uh, Objetos Perdidos, which, which you translated um, where Joanna is, is traveling around Madrid. It really came from when I was, uh, I took a school trip out to Madrid and uh, you know, it was a bit overwhelming. I had, I don't know, like 40 kids with me and one of them, had an accident and hurt himself. And I was leading these kids like the Pied Piper around Madrid and, uh, you know, all of these different sights and sounds. It was, it was really uh, a wonderful experience to be there, but also terrifying to have these kids with me. Luckily, my in-laws lived in Madrid and they're both doctors. So all of that was fine. Um, but I think it just, that implanted this idea with me. What if, you got lost in, in a city like Madrid and you didn't really speak that much of the language and you didn't have any money or any change of clothes or any water even. Um, so that one came along. Uh, the Helado Equivocado, which is the, the most recent one. Um, again, it's from experiences I've had out there. And there are a whole series of others that I can, I can churn out. So I'm a bit like, um, you know, one of these machines that you can crank the lever. <laughs> I can produce a one. I would say I, I certainly I don't have the same work ethic as uh, Dylan or Jan Franco. Those guys just they are unbelievable. I remember when they started on the Sentence Builders books and the first one, you know, we we're talking about maybe it would take six months and it took them like two and a half months to produce a textbook, which was just unbelievable. And within a year, they would churned out various different books, like, I don't know, three, four books, something like that. Um, with, with the creativity, with writing stories, it is much harder. Uh, it's, it's not harder, sorry. It's uh, more demanding on your brain, I think. It's, it's not something where you're churning out different exercises. You have to kind of work out, right, what's going to happen next? How is that going to link to what's already happened? How would these characters react in a, in a believable way? So you're absolutely right. There are times when uh, you, I write very little. I might write half a page or something in, in an hour and a half. And there are other times when I, I can get through quite a few pages. I think my key, and for any aspiring writers out there, uh, I, I just did a, a session actually at a conference about story storytelling and, and writing these short stories. The key is to continue writing and to push through it. And even if you do only write a few sentences, just do that. And then you can pick up uh, the next day and maybe you write a few more sentences or write, maybe you write a few more pages, um, but you can't just sit around thinking about it. You've really got to push yourself. So I suppose a shorter answer to your question would be, you ne I need to have a routine. Um, I need to find a slot when I can do it. I need to make sure that I'm at my desk, I'm at my laptop and I'm writing something, whether it is a little or a lot. Uh, and then over the course of time, of course, these stories appear on the page. Yeah, I do the laptop. I do tend to do quite a lot of brainstorming because, um, you know, for example, with uh, the latest story, um, so there's this this chap who's a flamenco dancer, um, an undiscovered flamenco dancer, and, and Yuki, who's from Japan, travels to Spain and, and sees him dancing um, when, when he thinks no one's watching. And, and I knew that there was something about his backstory, and it's quite weird because, of course, he's a character that I've created, but I knew that there was something that happened in his past that had caused him to not want to perform in the public and to be a bit reticent about his dancing. And also, you know, why was there this divide between where he lives on this sort of gypsy camp and the rest of the village? And, uh, uh, and it took quite some time to, to make those connections. So there were lots of mind maps and brainstormings and arrows going all over the place. Um, and, and all the while I'm also writing and sometimes whilst I'm typing on the computer, uh, a new idea will pop up that will go onto the brainstorm. <laughs> Uh, and it all sort of comes together. It evolves slowly like that. I would say so, yeah. Um, 
I, I think, yeah, I haven't thought about it really where they came from, but when the original Extranjeros idea came together, um, I think I wanted to have a group of really disparate people all together experiencing Spanish life because I work in an international school and we have kids from Azerbaijan to Eswatini to Zimbabwe to wherever, you know, all over the place. And I want them to sort of feel like they belong to the story as well. So by having a, a Japanese girl and having, um, you know, a German girl and this mysterious English guy and a guy from North Africa, um, I sort of wanted to, to represent different identities. Of course, you know, you can't represent all of the different nationalities and all of the different genders and everything. But I just wanted people to have an in and equally their personalities are very different. Um, Yuki you'll find is very courageous, a little bit reckless at times. And in the latest story of Extranjero, she, she does some pretty crazy stuff, which uh, I certainly wouldn't do myself, but it really pushes the, uh, the, the story forward because you've got this, this, this brave girl doing things. It's, it's a hard one. I, I do a book club here in Kuala Lumpur and uh, I feel like my favourite writer, it changes very regularly. If I had to answer now, I would say probably Cormac McCarthy. Um, we, I've always loved Cormac McCarthy and we recently uh, did All the Pretty Horses, which is a book I, I've always loved and it was suggested in our book club. And if you've not read that book, oh, wow, it's just it's an antidote to the hectic 21st century lifestyles we lead where we're constantly rushing around. If you read that book, you know, these huge expanses in uh, America and Mexico and these guys on horseback experiencing adventures that um, just really transport you to a different time in a different world. So yeah, he's, he's one of my favorites for sure. Yeah, okay, so uh, this, this again might change tomorrow, but the, the two countries that I think, um, everybody must visit before before they die are Japan. Japan is unlike anywhere else I've been on earth. It is the most uh, fabulous, exotic, warm, enchanting uh, place with just the most amazing culture, the most amazing food, the most amazing scenery. It's so diverse from tropical beaches to you know nearly Arctic conditions up in the north. And uh, one of my fondest memories, and I have so many from from living in Japan was, you know, going early morning to the, what was then the, the Tsukiji um, fish market in Tokyo, which was the biggest fish, fish market in the world. And, and you go and watch this just in incredible activity, this hive of activity very early in the morning. And then you can go and sit in one of the side bars and enjoy some, some very, very fresh sashimi for breakfast at like 5 a.m. or something. Wow. You can probably guess from, from Extranjeros and from Relatos, I think that Toledo in, in Spain is a truly magical place. Uh, if, you've, if you're not familiar with Toledo, um, I, anyone watching this video, please go and Google Toledo and click on images and you will immediately see what I mean. It is just a phenomenal medieval city with these wonderful cobbled streets and you never know what you're going to come across when you go down the streets. There's little bars and cafes and then you'll come across uh, a random synagogue that's been there since like the 12th century or something and there are huge basilicas and cathedrals and crypts and wonderful place. So I would say certainly that would be another one. And third, as a wild card, I'm going to throw out, um, yeah, you know what? I'm going to go with New York City. Okay. New York City. We lived in America for two years and Washington, D.C. is where we lived, which is also another amazing place to live. And I took my family to New York City and we went on the bus on like a Greyhound bus um, which also gave me another idea for a story, which we may see at one, one, one point. Um, but you get off the bus and you can feel the electricity. The atmosphere is electric in New York City. And just within the first five minutes, my son, who at the time was like five years old, I think, and my wife were just wide eyed like this place is insane. And it really is such a wonderful place. So there you go. There's my top three. I'd say my, my safe space is probably sitting in the bathtub with a, with a good book. So I, I love doing that. And, and if it's with, with other people, it's, it's with my family, finding a nice hawker stall. In Malaysia, there's amazing food on these little hawker stalls, someone with a wok 
and we'll sit there and you know chat and and eat lots of it's almost like uh southeast asian tapas because you can just order lots of different dishes and everyone tucks in um you know have a, a couple of cold beers on the side and it's it's a wonderful climate here as well so that's probably my favorite thing to do to relax